starting the best one. All right. Good morning, everyone. Who's had a good week enjoying listening to Russell's presentations? It's been a real blessing, hasn't it? Russell, do you want to come up and join us? Um, this is his last presentation this morning, so we will be gracious and um, kill the mics at about 10 to 11. No, just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, um, we can do it before, though. <laughs> oh, we, whenever you... Yeah, well, we went half an hour after your presentation yesterday. We went half an hour over time with, with Robbie, so, oh, you know... That gives me licence. You know, we've, we've, got, we've actually got another program at 11 o'clock, nah, so I'll be good. Yeah, we'll, we'll let you be good. Yeah. Um, but thank you for um, coming and, and sharing these presentations. I know it's been a real blessing. I don't know whether you know this, but people have been watching online and we've had up to 20 or 30 each morning watching right. online. Yeah, so um, I just want to acknowledge our online audience as well. So whatever you have here, you can then increase that by, and there's probably about six or seven, eight, nine people watching. Now, that's just telling me how many people yes. are online. That doesn't tell me how many people are in the room watching. Sure. So, yeah, yeah that's exciting stuff. Good. And so you will be able to re-watch these. You'll be able to order them through um, USB um, from the ABC or go to our YouTube channel, NAC at Big Camp, or Facebook yeah. as well, so that we be there. Let me pray with you. Thank you. Lord, thank you for... Russell and for his presentations this week Lord and be with him as he presents again this morning it's a it's an interesting topic and Lord I just ask that you be with him and give him the words to speak and help us Lord to learn more and understand more about our history in Jesus name Amen, Amen. Thank you All right good morning folk and uh, glad to see that you've made it on the last day of the week and uh, the weekend coming up you know you can start to uh, think about what's next so, uh, hmm, thank you for being here. Thank you for attending. I, I must uh, say that as well, and, and particularly being the early birds that attend, because as you probably have noticed, look around now and look around in half an hour's time, you know, it's, it's really increased. But we'll make a start anyway. So what we're doing at the moment is that we're, we've been obviously going through, the main three reformers um, are clearly uh, Martin Luther as the father of the 16th century Reformation, and then, of course, you've got his colleague, same time, across the border in Switzerland that we looked at, Zwingli. And uh, then, of course, next generation now, we are looking at the story of John Calvin. All right, so uh, Calvin in his communication, while he, and you'll see this as we go along, while you will learn that Calvin got his initial interest in the Reformation and the theology of the Reformation from Martin Luther, he was reading Martin Luther's uh, commentary on the Book of Romans, the one that I talked about also over in England, started things going over there. And in addition to that, he also had Erasmus's New Testament. So almost the same story as what happened across the channel is happening here with uh, um, John uh, Calvin as well. So John Calvin's story is not going to be as long as the other stories because I do want to today spend a little bit of time looking at the issue of uh, number one, how did the Catholic Church at the time respond to the uh, Protestant Reformation? And number two, how did, does it today, and even the uh, Protestant churches today, how do we respond to that? How should we respond to that today? So that's where I'd like to finish, so that for that reason we must get on with it. So let's begin. So we're looking at um, Calvin, and he's the one who stands tallest out of these four. He's the second along the line, as, as you see it. And uh, the one in front of him is Farrell. In fact, I think in a moment that will be uh, made known as well. Now, I'm going to actually share probably the first part of his story, not with other slides, but just going up to the map. You probably gathered by now I like maps. I like timelines and things like that. Uh, for my framework of thinking, it helps put things in place. And uh, so I'm going to do that. Now, to start with, um, Calvin was born just north, northeast a little bit, actually, uh, of Paris, and he came to Paris to do his initial study. He went to university. Isn't it interesting to notice how that almost every reformer that we have looked at in our story actually came out of university education, and while they're in the university, some seeds were planted that set them on a new journey. It, it, that's a, it is an interesting concept. So, 
Uh, that's what happened. So he was at Paris, and then he doesn't complete all his study at Paris. He uh, goes off to a couple of, like Bourges, I, I, pronounce, I assume you pronounce that Bourges without the ES in France. Um, and also there was another uh, um, university in France that he also attended before he finished his studies in Paris. But by the time he finished his studies in Paris, he, he quite clearly had um, begun to realise that, hey, uh, he, he needed to really investigate this issue that was coming in from across the channel. Oh, sorry, across the border, I should say. I was getting confused with the English story. So um, he started that search before he left university and it got him into a little bit of trouble. Unlike Martin Luther as well, his interests were in reverse in terms of what he studied. Uh, Luther came to study law and ended up becoming a monk. Calvin comes to be a priest and begins his study at the university to be a priest. But at his father's urging again, he was urged to uh, switch over to law, and he did, and I am so grateful that he did. Because I really believe that it was while he was studying law that he really fine-tuned his mind to produce one of the finest Christian works that we have called the Institutes, and I'll talk about that later. And he, had a, he was a brilliant man, there's no question about it. Uh, the way he was able to use his mind, etc., a, a brilliant man. So that all was really there in the story of Paris. But it was there while he was in Paris also that he um, sensed the opposition, in fact, a threat, because he was looking at these new teachings of Martin Luther. Uh, France at this stage was trying to hold back on it. Um, Geneva was getting away with it, as we'll see in a, a little later, down here in Geneva, because of what was happening in Switzerland. Um, but up here in the north, they were still fairly opposed to the Reformation thoughts that were coming across from, uh, from Germany, etc. All right, so he actually has to flee Paris, would you believe, uh, to protect himself. And his, the next little part of his journey, I, I, I'm not too familiar with every step, and it didn't take too many years from the time when he, at the age of 22, by the way, when he, he experienced what he called his conversion and became a true component, a, a, a true, um, you know, student, if you like, and uh, a, a, co totally convicted about the uh, Protestant truths and at the age of 22, and at this stage... He leaves Paris and uh, we know he goes to Strasbourg right there because Strasbourg, right at that particular point on the border between the two countries, became a protection point for people going either way across the border, which is interesting. Um, and so he went there for a while and uh, went further south down into Italy. On his way back, he called in at Geneva and uh, there when he called in at Geneva, he was invited to join up with uh, Calvin. He was only stopping for the night and wanted to just have one or two simple questions answered by um, uh, Farrell, who was, had already begun the Reformation in Geneva, but uh, the invitation he got from Farrell allowed him to stay a little longer. So that's the first part of the story. Perhaps I'll just mention why have I listed these other places down here. I'm going to very briefly talk about um, uh, the Huguenots after Calvin because he really, um, these are the people who followed him in their thinking, but uh, that's what happened down here in the southern part of France is where the strongest strongholds were for the uh, Huguenots and also where they received much of the opposition. Tower of Crest, Tower of Constance are two locations of where there were prisons for Huguenots and a quick couple of stories there. The museum, if you ever get, to the, get over to that way, is worth going to. And I should also mention again that Geneva is going to be the home of Calvin for his reform. So just like um, in the north of Switzerland, you have uh, uh, Zwingli already finished his time almost with the Reformation. Calvin, on the other hand, is working in the south. And obviously, as I mentioned yesterday, the south of, uh, of Switzerland, even today, is uh, a greater emphasis on French go to the north of Switzerland, a greater emphasis on German. And so uh, for that reason, uh, while it is in Switzerland, Geneva, just inside the border of Switzerland, um, it also is clearly uh, a French context. And really, um, 
This man is preparing for the French Reform Reformation, not the Swiss, although he did contribute. He, he added clearly to what uh, was already started by, um, by Zwingli. All right, let's uh, move on. Geneva, uh, probably we all know it for all these international organisations that live in Geneva. Again, because Geneva is such a, a location where it has accepted refugees, it has accepted the people who are escaping for, you know, a place of freedom, etc. And uh, Geneva today, nationally as well and politically, is, is certainly well represented by the uh, United Nations. And so this is um, Calvin, this is his life. You can see by the dating of this now that he is second generation to Martin Luther and Zwingli. And um, we, let's have a look at what's happening. This date appears on the Reformation wall that you saw just a minute ago, and you'll see it again shortly as well. Uh, fairly significant, 1536. This was the year that Luther, oh, sorry, Calvin actually arrives in Geneva to ask Farrell a question or two to just sort out in his mind about the Reformation theology, and Farrell really puts the pressure on him, um, almost says, you're going to burn in hell if you don't, um, you know, um, stay and give us your support. But uh, quite clearly, um, um, that really wasn't the motivation for Calvin to stay in the end, but he decided to stay, and that was the rest of his life there First of all, assisting uh, with uh, Farrell with the Reformation and then a little further uh, training up the next man to take his place as well. So that was 1536 and um, when he arrives there and he meets uh, Farrell and uh, he stays from that point onwards. But it's also the year, even before Calvin arrived, that the church in Geneva and the member as up there in... Uh, uh, Zurich, Zwingli had to get permission of the council, so did Farrell have to work through the council as well, and it was that year that the local council actually said, yes, we will be a Protestant uh, canton, because Geneva obviously was the city, but it is, includes the entire surrounds known as the canton as well. And so they decided for the Reformation the same year as Calvin came. So Calvin didn't introduce the Reformation to um, uh, Geneva, but he structured it, and we'll see this as we go along. So from that year, uh, 1536, for the next two, th two and a half years, both Calvin and Farrell led the Reformation in Geneva, and they organised, they formulated. Um, in fact, at that stage, Calvin had or he was well underway in the production of his uh, institutes, all right, and, and uh, because he had such a mind to organise systematically, th this is, syst you know, the institutes are a systematic theology that the Protestant church uh, values very much. And so it's a very important date, but incredibly, they do it too fast. And would you believe, in May 1538, they are chased out of Geneva, both of them. And they're banished, and so off they go. And Calvin ends up going north, and he goes back to Strasbourg. Remember how we saw before, he'd been at Strasbourg on the border there, between Germany and France, and it's there at Strasbourg that uh, Calvin remains for about three and a half years, uh, four years, nearly, and um, in that time also, one of the things that happened, he ends up uh, bringing conversion to a Anabaptist family. But sadly, the father of the family dies not long after they joined the Protestant Reformation from their Anabaptist background, and um, he ends up marrying the widow, um, Idette, who he describes as the love of his life. She had two children, and uh, they came uh, with... Um, because, as you're going to see in the next picture, uh, he's invited back in the year 1541, not with Farrell, but on his own. They're invited back, and he becomes the pastor of the uh, Geneva Church uh, Cathedral, if you want to call it that. It is a very significant church here. And um, he becomes the pastor of this church right up until his death. And they live the street down the, the way. But, uh, and sadly, she dies uh, early in the, his time there, but he continues to faithfully care for the children and be a father to them as well as everything else that you see that this man does. And that's really what I, sh what I want to show about you, um, or show to you about the man Calvin. 
Maybe if I turn the page over, that might stop that flapping page wanting to blow over because it's got no paper in it. This one will be better. Right. Let's, th now, on the uh, 500th anniversary of Calvin's birthday, any reason to have a celebration around the, uh, um, uh, the reformers? In fact, this is a good time to be doing it. Of course, it was only uh, six years ago that we were selling the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther nailing the, 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 30, uh, no, 35, the 95 theses up on the church door. And if you keep looking, following along in the life of Martin Luther, there were other great landmarks that were coming up to for a 500th anniversary too. Might be a good time for you at church to have a special program of an anniversary for um, Calvin or Zwingli or something that was happening significantly in the Reformation in their times as well because we're still in that 500-year zone. All right, so this was his birthday and they brightened up the church, which was nice. And uh, the church is a, uh, a very significant church, um, uh, I, I, in fact, I enjoyed it, much like the, uh, the one up in Zurich that Zwingli had been in, involved with because it too had been stripped of the icons and everything else and the, uh, any of the, uh, uh, the illustrations and, uh, you know, colour that the, the church actually has, I, I would have to say that it's been done uh, fairly tastefully, even including what's still called Calvin's Pulpit. Do you think we can keep some of the pastors out of this? Yeah. Um, some of you might know uh, this particular pastor from down uh, Brisbane Way. Um, he got up and, boy, he really looked like he was John Calvin swinging his arms around. So, um, unfortunately, we weren't able to get up there every time, um, but uh, in this case, we, we did manage to uh, get a few. Right there at the front, centre front of the, uh, the raised platform for where the altar in the previous church would have been, there is this table, and on the table, guess what? There is again the open Bible. And Calvin, just like um, Zwingli, was a great preacher um, from the Scriptures. In fact, you know, one of the interesting things was that when he was banned from uh, Geneva and went off to Strasbourg for those two, three years, and then he returned... Would you believe the very first sermon he preached after he returned was the very next sermon he was planning to preach after the last one he preached before he was banned. And so he gets up and just sort of continues on as if nothing else had happened. And he was in the middle of a series, only three and a half years, three years there to break the uh, continuity. But um, that was Calvin, a great pe preacher. And, uh, and, and by the way, it wasn't just the church service once a week. If you added up all the uh, times, both in terms of him lecturing, because there was a college that developed with the, uh, the um, cathedral as well, where he taught and lectured uh, regularly in that. He uh, preached several times a week in the church, not just once. And uh, every time, it was a new sermon. Uh, no pulling out, you know... Uh, my old sermon from 10 years ago because I caught, no, he could just come up with a new one because of his intensive study. I just think he had so much to share that uh, he always had these new sermons. He really had an enormous amount of energy. One of the things that he did where he expended a lot of his time was communicating with two colleagues, Melanchthon and Bollinger. Um, now, Melanchthon was the replacement for Martin Luther in Wittenberg. Bullinger was the replacement, and both men had been trained by their, uh, uh, the one who preceded them, uh, but Bullinger was uh, preceded by a Zwingli. And so he was in c contact with the German Reformation, the Swiss Reformation, uh, through those two men, and now he's you know, putting it all together for himself and for what will become the French people initially, but will go much, much wider than that as well. So can I just perhaps use this slide quickly to summarise for the uh, life of Calvin? Yes, he was certainly, at the time while he was at university, he was a very progressive uh, student. He was lecturing at the university much earlier than any of the other men were uh, during his student years. He got through the university in about half the time that, say, for example, oh, less than half the time than what Wycliffe did. You remember how long he took to get all his qualifications. Well, Calvin had them in just, you know, just a few years. He got it and uh, was ready to, uh, to go. But uh, so as a student, he was a great student, a great preacher, as we've already indicated. Sorry, just come back. Um, also a lecturer. 
he certainly, um, he lectured, as I mentioned, at the Geneva College um, and other places that were, he was able to visit. Um, you, you know, we mentioned yesterday the, the situation about when Zwingli brought in the communion, it was the council who said you can only do it four times a year at the religious festivals. That also influence went across uh, Switzerland uh, cantons and all councils were saying the same thing now. They're all saying, no, you can only have the Protestant uh, communion service four times a year at the religious festivals. But Calvin got around that by saying, hmm, I can't be in all the churches I visit and preach in uh, at the same place at just four times a year. So I think that allows me to have communion almost weekly as I itinerate around the church's preaching, and, but I'll never take it more than four times in any one church. So that's how uh, he got around that at that particular time. All right, author. Um, as I've mentioned, phenomenal. And I'll, I'll come back to it with the next slide as well. Uh, pastor. Um, one of the things I... Uh, when I was doing a, um, a, a college uh, unit... Uh, in Melbourne, this was at the um, uh, the Baptist College. Actually, I was doing a an MA, um, a, a master's, and the lecture I had um, was really good on Reformation history. Being a Baptist, he actually was a Baptist uh, pastor himself, and um, he uh, suggested, "Why don't I try doing this for a topic for uh, the essay we had to do for that topic?" And it was on the organisation and the structure that uh, Calvin put in place for his church. Now, it was a, a very positive thing, and we've, we've benefited from this, and we've been trying to see where have we benefited from the reformers and what they may have initiated. For example, he said there are four levels of organisation and authority in the church. First of all, there's the pastor or pastors, because he had more than himself pastoring uh, this and other churches that he was connected with. There's the pastors. Then there are... They call them the doctors, but they were the teachers. They also, um, you know, had a very high level of responsibility uh, in the church. And then uh, following that, there were going to be the elders um, and then the deacons. Now, we have elders and deacons. The roles are a bit different. For example, it was the deacon who did all the visiting and the, the caring in that sense of, uh, the, you know, the congregation outside the church, etc., um, and even counselling, it was the deacons who did it rather than the elders. The main role of the elders, and this is where we, we wouldn't go along with this uh, in terms of, you know, the main role of the elders. Um, the main role of the elders was that they were the disciplinarians of the church. And this is one of the criticisms that many people have about, about Calvin, is that he, it almost seems that he became legalistic himself. After getting away from a system of legalism... He set up, in fact, they call Geneva the, uh, the Rome of Protestantism, um, which is an interesting title, and uh, because um, this is what the elders had to do. They were given the responsibility that if anybody was reported of doing any wrongdoing, the elders were to speak to them one-on-one. -on -one. If there was no response, then do what the Bible says, take two or three elders with you and speak. If they still don't respond, go to the consistory. Now, the consistory was the, the board of elders. The elders and the pastor was the consistory, and it was a disciplinary committee. And so um, the, uh, the issue was brought to the consistory, and uh, they would sit in judgment, and they were fairly harsh because of Calvin's influence here. And uh, if they received the first ban, it meant they couldn't come to communion. You weren't allowed to attend communion if you had the first ban. If you had the second level of ban, you couldn't even come to church. And time frames were always put on this as punishment because of the things that they had done. And so you can appreciate why. I mean, it was very good to structure and organise the local church to be involved in the running of the church as well. But uh, probably in this, this regard, we would feel that the, he had gone quite overboard and he had become really quite rough. Uh, in dealing with, uh, with people rather than in the context of love and grace, which he clearly taught and understood and wrote about. And maybe we should get to that, seeing where the time is. For example, I mentioned these institutes, and the first one on the left-hand side that you'll see there, on your left-hand side, is uh, a copy of one of the very earliest uh, 
it actually comes from a, a later time even than Calvin himself, but in a 1559 edition of the Institutes, and that's just one particular page indicated, but you will notice that Calvin not only wrote the Institutes once, he kept revising, expanding, revising and expanding until eventually, even after his death, they continued to be revised and expanded, but most of the work is clearly Calvin's and the direction that they take is clearly Calvin's. And you can, you know, access today, you can notice there that they even have broken um, them up into three volumes, the institutes of the church, of the Christian church, that were originally written by Calvin and all credit is still given to him for that. Now, that were, they weren't the only things he wrote. He wrote extensively, more than any of the other reformers, probably more than all of them put together, and probably the greatest contribution of Calvin is that he has written more about Protestant theology than any of the other reformers, including Martin Luther. So we do acknowledge the busy man he was and the contributions that he made, even though we may not go along with, and of course another area that we're uncomfortable with was his view of predestination. And look, we won't even begin to have a discussion about that because we might not even get out of here today if we did that. So we'll, we'll move right on. All right, now let's quickly do this. Uh, so there, there's the Reformation wall, and you can see here William Farrell, the man who introduced him. He's the man on the left. Then there's Calvin himself. And then there's uh, Theodore Bees, now, or Bizet, however they pronounce it. I, I'm not sure on that. But uh, he was the one who was trained up to be Calvin's replacement, and he did an excellent job in Geneva after him. Then John Knox. Now, you probably know John Knox. That's Scotland. Yeah, you're right. Because what happened, Knox sort of challenging the church initially, got into a little bit of strife. In fact, he joined a rebellion or a, a protest and he, in the end, was captured by a Catholic uh, army from France and was sent to the gallows and eventually, after about a year of rowing in the gallows, he escapes and he goes straight to Geneva and he became a, a, a student of John Calvin. And so by the time he leaves... Geneva to go back to Scotland to need to the uh, Scottish, um, you know, Reformation and to bring what we call today Presbyterian um, uh, teachings. It was a reform, what was known as the reform side of the Protestant uh, Reformation, and uh, that was uh, um, Knox, probably regarded as one of the greatest influences beyond Calvin with the reform teachings that continued on with a very significant movement. But that's not all. Look at this. And you can see the names there of the six men who are in lower statue, but right along this uh, wide wall. And uh, these six men, some of them are military uh, individuals. In fact, um, after, uh, what was it, the 2000 and 19 tour, I think it was, um, I decided I wanted to go to Hungary to see if I could find more evidence there for Roboski. Uh, and his role in the, in, uh, the political scene and military uh, scene, etc., in Hungary, he was a Calvinist. He was a, a strong Protestant um, reformer with a Calvinist background uh, with the Reformed Church and so on. And so he takes that to Hungary. And you can see, I won't go through all of them, probably names like Oliver Cromwell there, number five, and the influence he had in England. He was Calvinist right to the back teeth. And uh, again, if you look at the work that he did in England while he was holding the reins of control there when there was no monarch on the throne, um, he was a little bit like Calvin. He, he was pretty tough, but behind him was still a man who understood that salvation was in Jesus Christ and not him and his actions. All right, let's, keep, let's go on. Um, they do acknowledge on the Reformation wall, on two separate blocks, one at each end, not connected to the wall, just disconnected a little, Luther and Zwingli, saying, we, we've got our own Reformation here in Geneva, and uh, that's okay, they can do that. So that's briefly the story of John Calvin, and, and as we probably move through today. I will refer back on several occasions to Calvin. Um, but it, it's, he's a man who accomplished enormous things in the time period uh, that he lived. And uh, what he did, it really was quite enormous, the, uh, the work of uh, Calvin. And, um, you know, we, we do value the, the positive things that came forward. 
Um, later on, it might be possible for me to give you one quick story about where he fell into a bit of trouble when he, uh, he did the same thing um, to some of uh, the people uh, who were not being... They were in the, the Reformation movement, but because they hadn't accepted the deity of the Trinity, um, they were anti-Trinitarians, or he was, uh, Calvin did not support the council's decision to burn him at the stake. In fact, he, he, he gave the nod to it. Um, and you think, what? Um, they, they are suffering this persecution opposition themselves. Why don't they uh, respond and do something? Uh, oh, here he is, actually. I'm sorry. The, the slides are here. This is Michael Savitas is the man I'm talking about. Um, you know, he's a local Spanish theologian, preacher, accepted the Reformation teachers, but not the Trinity teaching, all right? And because of his criticism, he ends up with the death sentence from the council. Calvin didn't oppose it, just gave it a nod. Yeah, he opposed what I'm teaching. Um, he can go. Because, as you're going to see when we get to how did the counter-Reformation react, don't be too hard on what happened in this regard about opposition to those who didn't follow along where you were going, like the Catholic Church was doing to Protestants, because the reality is when the Protestants became the majority, they did some of the same stuff back to those who opposed them. And if you particularly want to see it in action, not just on the continent, but probably over in England, that became very evident that was what was happening there. And they do have a statue today of Michael Savitas, uh, not near the Reformation Wall, a little further away, just to acknowledge uh, his role as a reformer too at that particular point in time. Okay, I'm now going to get into the story of the Huguenots, those who followed uh, Calvin. The story of the Huguenots is an interesting one because it, it actually probably is one of the greatest stories of struggle and survival and it resulted in eight wars over a quick period of time and uh, there was much bloodshed. And um, the, uh, you, you probably will be familiar with some of these uh, events that I quickly described. Um, we're going to ask ourselves the question, so who were the Huguenots? Number one, they were the Protestants of France who were following the teachings of uh, John Calvin. Number two, about the time Calvin died, there was about 200,000 followers across France already, mostly in the south, but not only, northwards as well, crossed to Paris as well. Um, they were there, all right, about 200,000, but they soon would number millions, all right? But let's keep going. And um, the uh, other thing here is that uh, I've got seven, I, well, seven or eight civil wars uh, were held there in France, Catholic versus Protestant, where tens of thousands of people on both sides of the fight were, were killed. So Huguenots became, they had a pretty rough time uh, after the acceptance of uh, the Protestant uh, teaching. More than 300,000 leave France and migrate to uh, Protestant countries. Now, um, we have noticed this in several places, for example, in Germany, a very big Huguenot church there and a big following. Do you know one of the things that was really happening here? That those people who were accepting Protestantism were amongst, amongst a majority of those people who were skilled artisans, watchmakers, and uh, people who were, you know, skilled with jewellery, etc., etc. It was a bit of a brain drain to France attacking the Huguenots. And they took their skills with them to Switzerland, watchmakers. Where did they come from? They came initially from France. And, and so it goes. So that's a, a part of the story of the Huguenots. Now, this event has probably been a name you've heard banded around from time to time. St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. You can see the date there, 1572, just a few years after Martin Luther's death. And uh, look, in, in Paris on that particular day when the command was given, over a thousand men, women and children were just slaughtered because of their Huguenot connections. That was just the start of it. That was one day. Over the next few days and the weeks that followed, they just continued the massacre right across France. And there literally were tens of thousands, rivers that flowed with the colour red from the blood of those who were martyred at that time. Um, the, um, the Tower of uh, Crest, we, we're not going to take the time to go into this place, but this was a, a prison that uh, many of the um, Huguenots ended up sadly suffering badly in this prison. 
Um, these three dates are kind of interesting. They are the uh, 1598. Um, this was the date of what was called the Edict of Nantes. Now, the Edict of Nantes was, oh, that's early. It normally kept for um, uh, Robbie when he comes for the next session, isn't it? But it's come early today. The Edict of Nantes was probably the, uh, the work of the French king. He was Henry IV, French King Henry IV, not the English one, who um, had been a Protestant. He'd been influenced by them, but he was pulled back into Catholicism. And uh, that was probably political but he was still very sympathetic towards the Protestants. So he introduced what was called the Edict of Nantes, and the Edict of Nantes was freedom of worship, religious liberty, okay? And for a year, uh, sorry, a century, they got freedom. And then you come to the Edict of Revocation. They reversed Louis XIV. You know that name in history, don't you? He was the one who undid that edict and persecution started again. You can see it goes through nearly another hundred years for the Huguenots until finally we come to the Edict of Toleration. And this was uh, much the influence of one particular man in many uh, centuries later from uh, Calvin, and that was the man uh, William of Orange or um, um, what, William the Silent, I think he's identified in the, uh, the Reformation world. All right, so there are three uh, significant dates in their story, but I'm going to finish their story by taking you down to the Tower of Constance. This is down in the southern part of France, and uh, this particular tower, initially as this um, uh, inside in uh, tri-language, but I've enlarged the English section of it, uh, it's telling us that uh, following the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, this tower was used as a prison for the Huguenots and then it turned to a, a prison just for the women of the Huguenot uh, following. And, uh, and so we're going to look at the story of just one woman very quickly, and you can see what I've underlined there in red, um, Marie Duran. She was imprisoned simply because she was about to be married to a young man who was a pastor. Her brother was a pastor. And they imprisoned the father, the brother, her to-be husband, and then she might as well be put in prison too because she was going to be the wife of, the brother of, and the daughter of. That's all that they had on her. And she was imprisoned for a period of how many years? Can you do your maths? From 1730 to 1768. 38 years for nothing. When they released her, she was an old woman and didn't live very long, sadly. But one of the interesting things about this story is that every day the priest, the local priest, would come in and offer to the people, and specifically to Marie Duran, offer to her release and freedom if she would recant her situation, etc. But she always declined, declined, declined. All right? And if you go into... Oh, here's a couple of... Uh, uh, artworks which I found down in that Huguenot Museum, just sort of showing you how Marie became one of the uh, leaders amongst these uh, women who were coming into captivity. Some were there only for a short period of time, some were for longer periods of time. She became the chaplain, really, amongst these women over the years. But every time the priest came along and said, recant, recant, and you can go, she said no, and went back to her prison circumstances for 38 years. And what you can do, you can actually go to the, um, it's the second floor, first floor is for the guards. Nice and warm down there, big open fireplace. The heat comes up through the grate there a little bit to the second level where the women were kept in the prison. I think he's nearly gone. Can you hear? Yes. Underneath the glass, Marie had another stone scratching on that stonework, and she was uh, scratching. Here you can see it. R-E-G-I-S-T-E-R. -E -E Register, we would say in English, but it's the French word for resist. 
and she just kept scratching away at it and scratching away at it until today, centuries later, you can go and see the very stone that she wrote this in, resist, resist, resist. And she did for 38 years and stood faithful. Hey, they're the people that we are acknowledging that uh, are a great part of our, um, our own her um, heritage that we have. Uh, it it's just something that I think we need to acknowledge. All right, now I'm going to leave at that stage that part of the story and I'm now going to go to the second part of what I wanted to do today and that is how did the Catholic Church respond to the Protestant Reformation? All right, let's move fairly quickly with this. It's called the Counter-Reformation and you can go to any church history book, put in a search for Counter-Reformation or go to the index for it and you'll find this story. All right, uh, one, one particular author, Howard Voss, he makes this uh, statement about the Counter-Reformation. He said the Roman Catholic or the Roman Church learnt from the Reformation and set its house in order somewhat. Yeah, some of the practices that the Reformers had been attacking and criticising of the Church, they changed. And the Roman Catholic Church today is not the Roman Catholic Church of 500 years ago. Please recognise and realise that. They've had a significant change and upgrade at this time too. All right, let's move on. Without giving you all that detail, let's move on. Doctrinally, they had an upgrade at what was known as the Council of Trent. And uh, here at the Council of Trent, this is after Martin Luther, um, they called in all their leaders from across Europe, etc., to come to Trent. Trent's in northern Italy. It seemed to be a convenient place for them all to meet. And they started to review. Now, notice the date. It's almost 20 years. They didn't stay there for 20 years. They came in, went home, came in, went home, etc. And it went on for a, a period of time and they met many times. And during that time, they were reviewing their positions. Let me say that in most of them, I would, or I, well, I was going to say 95%, but I, I don't have anything to sort of base that on or seeing anybody else sort of quote, but it would seem that 95% of what they did was just rubber stamping what they already taught and would continue to preach and practice that. Their doctrinal change was minimal, but there was a little bit of fine tuning, all right? And so that came as a result of the Reformation for the church too. We actually visited, went on, called in on one occasion when we were visiting with the uh, Olivers, uh, Cal, um, we, uh, we decided to go and have a look at uh, this church and it was an interesting church and they had this painting up there, uh, well, I'll say it was a print of a painting that's been done and uh, just showing you all the church leaders across the uh, country coming in. So uh, it was nice to get that uh, copy. All right, so that was the Council of Trent. Now, the, uh, the next thing that we ought to note is that apart from their own clean-up, um, you've got to say also that it's more than a coincidence that there was a re-emphasis, a re-digging out some interpretations on prophecy. Can you imagine when they are being told, as they were by these Protestant reformers, I mean, you can read it in Martin Luther's writings as easy as you could read it in uh, Ellen White's writings, for example. You can read it very clearly where it's pointing at the Catholic Church as the mark of the beast, and uh, fulfilling the little horn of Daniel 7 and all the rest of it. Because they had accepted what we call as the historicist view of interpretation. Christina gave us a little bit of a, a ups, heads up on this on Sabbath in her lesson. Historicism says that we interpret the book of Revelation, I'll start from this side for you, from uh, the time of Jesus right through to the time of the end of the world, or even beyond into heaven and the millennium and so on. So it's consistently right across there in bits and pieces and that's what Robbie's been doing as well in the, the timeline that he's been putting out as well. But the other views of interpretation, for example, the preterist view says, oh, look, it's all fulfilled in the time of Rome and everything applies to that time, it's not relevant to us now and uh, kind of forget it, okay? So that's going out on a bit of a limb to say that. that that's, but this guy, Alcazar, he came and reviewed and really popularised this view that was taking the heat off the Catholic Church about the, you know, the interpretations of the prophecies, isn't it? 
And so uh, that was fine for them. And then there was another, also coming from, uh, from Spain, Spanish uh, uh, theologian by the name of Ribina, Ribera, who said that futurism, ah, oh, look, it's so far into the future. It, no, no, this is the end of the world and we're, we're not there. We're nowhere near there. Just forget it. Don't worry about it. It's, it's for the end of the world. And so Revelation be ignored. So that was, once these two men came up and sort of popularised their, their interpretations again of uh, how to interpret the book of Revelation, um, you can see immediately that there was a bit of relaxing about the feeling of Revelation by the, the main church at that stage. And uh, they really helped push these two men with their two uh, points of view and theology. We'd love to have time to talk about the value of all three of those points of view. While we're historicists as a church, don't ignore the, the views of what these two men have said uh, in the aspect of reoccurring prophecy, all right? And, and, but we don't have time to touch that, I'm sorry, so we'll move on. Now, here's the third thing. There were peaceful attacks also against the reformers. Initially, the organisation of the Jesuits was for uh, the purpose of re-educating their own people in the teachings of the church. When I mention the word Jesuit, you might say, oh, what story we got now about, you know, and in recent years and, and in, since the time of the Reformation, the Jesuits have become involved in some horrible things. Um, and we sort of say, you know, they're the secret police of the church and all that kind of thing. But don't ignore initially what they were up to. Um, and this was a peaceful way, re-educating, getting the people to understand it better. Now, here's one particular church that gives you an idea, as you see it today. Now, by the way, it was uh, this church, the Church of Jesu, Jesus, um, which is in Rome, right in the heart of Rome. Um, it was uh, founded right there at the time at the end of the, the, the work of Martin Luther and these other reformers. That's when they founded this church by the uh, particular uh, Jesuit, um, I think it was, uh, I didn't put his name down here in this case, um, I'm sorry. But uh, it's interesting today as you look at the church, notice the two icons that are just beyond and above the door as you go in. And it's quite clear what the attitude of the church is to heretics. You stand on it. You stamp out heresy. All right? Go inside the church. Lovely church inside. Beautiful, bright cathedral. Um, pretty lavish in a way. But then there are some side chapels. And they tell good stories. One particular chapel has a couple of statue, uh, monuments in it. This one here is, uh, is, is showing that the church is dominating over paganism and the church is represented by the woman. On the other side of the chapel, there's another statue that shows that the church, the same you know, church symbolised by the woman with the cross, is now uh, dominating over heresy. And, of course, who are the heretics? Oh, well, they're the, uh, the Protestant leaders. In fact, the, the one lying down, um, and I, I'll just... Uh, I can't point, but the one lying down on the front there is Martin Luther, and he's been stood on with a volume under his arm. The one at the back is John Calvin. All right? The one over... See the little Puto right over the other side? Little angel Puto. And uh, they... He's actually pulling out pages from the book of Zwingli. Have a look at this. This um, photograph I took in 1984, see how clearly the name is on Martin Luther, John Calvin, on the spine of those two books. So it's quite clear who those two figures are representing. All right? And then, oh, and then it's interesting also, uh, this photograph I took in 2005, can you see it as well? In the 20 years, it seems the clean has been very industrious at helping to rewrite history. And I, I can't get into that, but I, I'll just leave that with you for something to think about. Um, all right? And then across the other side, the little puto, pulling out the books, the pages of Zwingli's writing, if you have a look here... Can you see that the, the, the back of the book there is what you've got there? And very carefully, you may be able to see it from where you are. But again, it's very faint. But there is the name of Zwingli. He's pulling out Zwingli's teachings and writings and throwing them away. So that was the attitude of the church about heretical writings. All right. Now, the fourth thing I want to say is that, yes, there were peaceful means and there were good ways in which the church, the Catholic Church, responded to the Reformation, 
But these are the, this is the side that we don't particularly enjoy about how the Catholic Church related. But I want you to understand that, I've already said it once today, the reformers themselves, I could even give you a story about Zwingli being, uh, joining up with the council of, uh, and, and drowning the Anabaptists in the river because they were opposing what he was saying. This is a part of the culture of this time. Life seemed to be fairly cheap and meaningless almost. And to dispense with somebody by burning the stake or drowning them or beheading them or whatever else because they weren't following the party line, you and I see that is an anathema in our context, in our context of religious liberty and freedom of worship, etc. They didn't have that. They didn't understand that back there. And so this is how it became expressed by the Catholic Church towards the Protestant. It was forceful. And we've been looking at stories of uh, Jan Hus, who was burnt in the flames. We looked at the story of the Hussites, who were defeated in mass. And here are these 27 crosses, you know, representing the 27 leaders in the the city of of, um, Prague that were killed in the Battle of White Mountain, etc. And, and we could just keep looking at these different illustrations, the stories of the Waldenses that we noted and how they were slaughtered over a period of time in thousands. So this was a part of the Counter-Reformation too. Uh, Zwingli was killed in a battle of a Catholic canton that had come against a Protestant canton and he wanted to defend as well. Went out there with a sword and he died with a sword. And um, the Huguenots that we've been talking about together, you know, the wars of religion that uh, followed uh, the Protestant Reformation um, in France alone, uh, it was significant, but it went right across Europe. And so this all became a part of the the forceful, the not-so-pleasant side of the Counter-Reformation, but we need to acknowledge it. Now, is that how the church is operating today? No. No. I want to share with you now a couple of illustrations to show there has been a huge mind shift. So what are you Seventh-day Adventists talking about? About we're coming up to the worst of the time of trouble. That's nothing. What's what's coming? Have a look at uh, these um, few slides. The arrow is pointing to a fountain. You can see that uh, this is a postcard, obviously. Um, I don't carry a drone with me. It'd be nice to, though. But um, uh, you can see the Colosseum the ruins of the Colosseum there. So it's only about 200 metres away from the Colosseum. There's a very significant event has taken place. Um, The interesting thing uh, about this event is that, remember, this is in Rome, the heart of Catholicism, the very place from which the attack against Protestantism has come. All right, let's go to the arrow point. There's the fountain. And uh, swing around behind you and take a photograph. There's the uh, Colosseum, just down between the pine, the uh, the pines. That's where the Colosseum is. That close. So we are right in the heart of ancient city of Rome. And uh, obviously, there's something pretty important happening here on September 16, 2015. There are people from all the churches, Catholic Church and Protestant churches. They've all gathered together for an important event. And uh, you can see there's a bit of clapping of hands going on. Look there at the right-hand, bottom-hand corner. They're about to celebrate because something is about to be unveiled. What is it? It's this little statue standing up there, and there it is. It's been unveiled. What does it say? Oh, we've just named the fountain after Martin Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer, the one who has stripped our coffers of money by introducing the Protestant teachings. And we could go on and on and on. And here they're honouring Martin Luther, the great reformer, at this important event. And you're saying, wow. And I said, wow, too. In fact, so much so that uh, next time I went there, of course, I wasn't there at that event because um, it happened at a time when, when, you know, I wasn't leading a tour. But on another occasion, the, the very next time, off we go to this site now as a significant place, something that's happened in Rome that's relevant to the Reformation and recognising the Reformation and the role of the Reformation. And so uh, it is a significant thing. Now, here's the interesting thing. I didn't know that this is how it would end up, but in my very first tour that I was leading, we arrived at the Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, in Rome, only about uh, two or three kilometres from the Vatican, 
And um, there I was, we, we were there early. We, we didn't realise that they started half an hour late, uh, later than what we were used to here in Australia. And so we were there um, in ready for Sabbath school before half past nine. And lo and behold, they weren't starting till 10 o'clock. And this gentleman comes up to me, Carlo was his name, and he says, hey, you're, a Reform you're on a Reformation tour? And uh, I said, yeah. He said, come, come. And he said, bring your group in here. And it, we came in and he put on a little uh, section of uh, uh, footage, I guess it was a PowerPoint, and he said, I've had a passion to have the, the Council of Rome recognise Martin Luther. And I've set out and he was showing me all the possibilities of how this could happen and how he was going to the council and uh, presenting his information to the council. But then as the article in the Review and Herald acknowledges that he was the initiator of this program, they sadly also had, had to tell how he died very quickly from cancer. And uh, so while it was a Seventh-day Adventist who initiated that action, it was then taken over after he died by other Protestant churches and the event took place, as you saw, um, only just those few years ago. But it was recognised right from the head of all churches, including the Catholic Church, to allow that to happen right at their doorstep. Now that's a change, isn't it? They wouldn't have done that 500 years ago. All right, here's another one. Um, for Protestants, the, our icon is the um, uh, Wittenberg, uh, you know, the, the church where the 95 theses were, were nailed up there to the door. Okay, you all kind of recognise that from our talk on Wednesday. And uh, now here's another postcard, aerial shot. And you can see the church, it's uh, right up the top, the orange roof of the actual cathedral and the castle church, as it's called, the square that goes around it. And right one street over, here is a what was just a paddock, now they've turned it into a garden called the Luther Garden um, in Wittenberg. And uh, what they were doing leading up to the year 1517, which was going to be the anniversary when Martin Luther nailed up his 95 theses, they were going to have 500 trees planted in the Luther Garden or around the streets in Wittenberg. They were going to get 500 trees planted by the churches all around out there worldwide can come along and plant a tree to recognise their connection with Martin Luther. Okay? And so uh, the, the journey began. Now, that photograph must have been taken very early. And before we go, I want you to notice also this, that there is uh, right here at the centre of it, this shape of the five petals of the rose is called the Luther Rose. And it was the uh, logo that Luther himself uh, was very used and was aware of and has still been um, used and identified as the Luther Rose. Look it up on the internet. You'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Five petals. All right, let's go on. So we, uh, by the time we got there, the trees were growing up. And, um, you know, this is just before 1517. Uh, and uh, obviously, they'd be much bigger by now already. But uh, as we went looking around, go and search and see who you can find. Who's putting all these uh, trees in? And so they went searching and one guy yells out, hey, come over here, here's a Seventh-day Adventist one. And you can probably read this, can you? Uh, Sabaton, uh, tag, Adventist, Seventh-day Adventist. Pastor, whoever, from Germany. Their church has put one in. And they had to, in return, do one also in their own local church. So they plant one there in Wittenberg, one in their home church, all right? And so I became interested to say, okay, who's put then, uh, whose names on these five trees that are sitting between the petals of the Luther Rose? So we went for a search of that. And we found that in the first one, uh, this is the Methodist Church. Can you see the name Methodist here is identified? And uh, this one is the Reform Church. Well, that's fair enough, you know, Martin Luther's connection with it. So headquarters there have done that. This is the Anglican Church. So the English got involved with it as well. And we're down to number three. Number two, the Orthodox Church has come in on the act. That's interesting. Who's going to get number one? Because, uh, and this is the tree for number one, who's got their plaque at the bottom of number one? It's got to be the Lutheran church, surely. Well, look at this, Vatican. The Catholic church got position number one in the Luther Rose. Martin Luther would turn in his grave. But that's what's happening. Now, 
Where did they plant the other one then? Now, you can't get into all the Vatican, but fortunately they put it in a public place and it's here with this church, which is called St Paul's, beyond the wall. And uh, you can go to this church inside another beautiful church and every pope, according to their interpretation, going right back to Peter, uh, pictured up above um, those circles going out that way and that way and up in the, in the alcoves, they're everywhere and every pope is identified, even you can see right down to Francis, you can find them all there scattered all around the, the, uh, the walls, the high walls in the church. So this is a significant, in fact it's one of the five cathedrals of Rome, okay? Now, when I went outside, I found that there is an olive tree not the same kind of tree, but an olive tree, and the plaque that you can't read in that photograph, close up, I can read the English down here, and because our time is running out, I can notice down here it says, link to, I better get back to be able to read it, link to the tree placed in the Luther Garden in Germany, it is a sign of the growth of communion between the Lutheran World Federation and the Catholic Church. So this is the, the, the corresponding uh, tree that's been placed here as well. Think, something's happening. Things have changed here and uh, maybe you're aware of that as well. When, the, um, uh, when they were holding the um, anniversary and you can see here that the date for this is just exactly uh, one year leading up to the, uh, the date for Martin Luther nailing up the 95 Theses and the 500th anniversary of that event, there was a great uh, beginning, almost like a, a Christmas Eve, this is a year eve. The year before the Lutheran Church began to celebrate uh, this great 500th anniversary for Martin Luther. The headquarters today of the Lutheran Church is not in Germany, it's in Sweden. And this is the church and the Pope has turned up for it. It's in uh, Lund, in uh, the cathedral here in Sweden, and the Pope has turned up to become a part of it. And there the, the uh, Lutheran, actually the actual leader is the lady. Maybe it wasn't politically co correct for them to be so touchy, uh, but uh, the next man who's actually embracing there with the Pope uh, is second in charge of the Lutheran church at that point in time. Getting pretty buddy-buddy for two people who uh, in the past would not dare have done that. And, um, and here's another thing that I found interesting. About the same time, uh, these pictures uh, surfaced on the internet showing um, uh, Charles and Camilla. Uh, obviously, this is well before they uh, become king and queen. But um, here they are visiting the Pope and they're giving him gifts. These are the gifts he gave him. They took them down into the, uh, the, uh, the security room where there were very secure documents and they're sharing with them some of the secure documents that you and I would never get a chance to look at. Again, getting very close, aren't we? But what about, you might have seen this and this might be on your memory uh, as well. This just came up a few months ago, didn't it, at the coronation. What was carried as a part of the procession into Westminster Abbey? It was this cross. Where does it come from? It was a donation from the Pope, Pope for the current Pope. It was his donation, only on loan, because it contained some of the relics of the cross. But just to have the, the, the papal blessing on this, you know, um, coronation, uh, I will lend you my cross. Now that's... These are things that would not have happened 500 years ago. That's what I guess I'm trying to say. And again, the, the, uh, from conflict to uh, communion. And uh, this is this book, and you can see here, Catholic priest and a, a Protestant. I don't know the actual background of the man, but he was Protestant by the, uh, uh, the context of the article at the time, um, in terms of we're coming together in our understanding about the communion. Now, the coming together is we're coming together if you understand what I mean. Um, that's unfortunately one of the things that's happening. Now, I started asking the question, what's going on, you know, with our understanding of events for the end of the world and what's happening now? Well, maybe this might start to help us. Do you know who these two people are? The Pope you'll recognise. This is Pope Francis. And it's only just, um, I think, uh, t this is 2015, I think. He is embracing here the head of the Valdensian Church in the Valdensian Church in Milan, which is one of the bigger Valdensian churches available today. Date announced, 
And what has he come for? Well, he's come for what he's been doing everywhere. Notice right in the middle, 2015, Waldensian Christians asked to forgive the Catholic Church for, this, uh, for the historic persecution. And go back, I mean, these are just starting with Francis, if we'll see how we go with time. Apologies to the Pentecostals for the remission under the, um, sorry, for repression under the Italian fascism. That was 2014. 2015, apologies to the indigenous people of the America for the church's role in colonialism. All right? Apologies. And they're coming one after another. Next one in 2015. A th- um, a third time, he's apologizing, apologizing for the sexual abuse in the church and to the victims of that. Sixteen, uh, apologizing to the refugees for some Catholics' indifference and closed-mindedness. Also sixteen, apologies for the church's persecution of gay people. Now, can I uh, add another one to his list? This was just last year. He apologised to the Indians of North America in Canada. All right, So he's apologising to them for the outcry that has come from them for, their, for the Catholic Church's treatment of the residential schools in Australia. You know what the word was that we use for this. But here he is apologising for uh, the treatment given to the students at that particular time. And the, the particular article where I got that photograph said, this is the first step. Oh, first step. What's the second step? What's the, where do we go from here? And that's a question we'd like to ask ourselves, isn't it? OK, and look, um, if you were to go back, um, it, it got quiet in terms of apologies during the COVID years. It's interesting. And that's probably fair enough because uh, no one was travelling too much, were they? But if you go back even to the time it started with uh, Pope John Paul II, and here you're back in 1992, he apologises um, to Galileo because of his claim about the rotations of the earth, etc., that the Catholic Church years ago burned him at, uh, did they burn him at the stake? But anyway, he was killed, he was made a martyr for his uh, heretic teaching about the rotation of the earth, etc., all right? They've apologised to me for it. They apologised to the church's role in the African slave trade, uh, the church's role in burning the relig- and the religious wars that followed the Reformation. Oh, so there's a blanket statement for the Reformation. Get some spe- specific in places. Apologised to women for the centuries of oppression. Apologised for the church's inaction during the Holocaust. That's interesting, isn't it? For the execution of Jan Hus, a specific one. A- acknowledging, yeah, we did it and we're sorry. And please forgive us, all right? And um, there's a couple more that you could just finish with there for uh, Pope John Paul before, obviously, after uh, Benedict. Benedict did not do many apologies, um, but you can see there there's apologies also for, uh, you know, to different ethnic groups um, for violating their rights, um, for the attack, the Crusaders' attack on Constantinople, Triple one in 2001 where he hits uh, sexual abuse, stolen generation of Australian Aboriginal children and the uh, missionary conduct in China. And then Benedict likewise here, another apology for sexual abuse. So these apologies have been made and they're significant apologies that have been made right across the world. And when you look at this, you ask, yeah, what is going on? Um, What's happening here? What's... what? What have we been prepared for or have we been totally misled in our understanding of Revelation? Um, I would like to make suggestions. You, can, you have your own interpretations about these things, but I'd like to make a suggestion here that the, this is an approach that I think is an intentional approach of the church. We would talk about it in terms of church unity, You know, the churches uniting together and becoming as one strong voice again. And when that uh, comes to its full extent, we will be convinced that, look, you know, um, we're coming up to tough times here because we can see oppression coming out of that. But it's it's bringing, you know, the, the Christian church together again. And it is. Because while we've seen the attitude of the, the Catholic church, the interesting thing is that, number one, their interpretation of doctrine since 
the, uh, you know, where we noted there when they came together in that council in, in Italy and uh, they re-examined, that was done again at Vatican I, Vatican II in the last century. And uh, out of Vatican II, great liberties, etc., and changes came and were announced. I can remember before Vatican II, um, the Catholic kids on the school bus were almost offended if they saw a Bible because Catholics weren't allowed to own a Bible. But after Vatican II, they were and encouraged to. So there have been changes. Let's not deny that for what has happened. But underneath, there still seems to be, and it keeps leaking out from time to time, and I'm sure you've seen, and I, I've deliberately not put up all that kind of thing, but you, I'm sure you have seen that uh, that's not always how it's going to be. But it's preparing society for what is coming. And it won't be somebody like Francis. I mean, the man is old as anyway. But it's going to be somebody probably of a, of a different nature and character than, uh, than Francis who, will, who can make very different demands than what Francis makes. He's a very gentle man, concerned about the environment. Interesting to how he's using that to even appeal for Sunday sacredness to, per, to protect our environment by having a day off and talking about Sunday. And so it goes. And so I, I think that we, we need to be aware of it, but be very firm in our own minds about where we're going. My conclusion to the, the week of talks would be this. Christianity is a memory religion. You look at the Bible, look at the Psalms, <clears throat> full of experiences where they looked back to the time of the Exodus, to the time of the creation, and David seemed to be always reminding people of what God has done in the past for what he'll do now. Come to the New Testament, the establishment of the cross, and now looking back to the cross makes Christianity a memory religion. And I could give you many uh, illustrations of that. But sometimes we feel that our memory only needs to go to sacred history as defined by the two lids of the Bible. But I'd like to suggest to you from what we've looked at this week that... <clears throat> There is other parts to sacred history as well. I think the Reformation period is a period of sacred history. I think the founding of the Adventist church is a period of sacred history where we see God working in a mighty way to bring new truths to light. And I think it's important for us to look back, look back and draw the value of the good things from that past and take them on board. Yes, yes. As we see with the development of the church doctrine, Tom, the time of the Reformation, right down to the Adventist church into our own time, th there's a, a kind of a, a fine-tuning of it from time to time as we go along. That's why 27 fundamentals became 28. I guess they were fine-tuning. Did it change? Probably didn't really, but the, the way it was presented, it did. But yeah, there is fine-tuning, etc. But the reality is that the basics are still there and that we need to hang on and hold on and to continue to have them very much as a part of our uh, life and our Christian experience and our journey with God, so that if we're still here, when those times that we know in the future, according to Revelation, are going to be pretty tight, pretty tough, then uh, we know that if we are committed to Christ and the truths that he has unloaded for us down through the centuries, then we can be strong in the Lord and we can be faithful to him to the very end. And that's my prayer for you and that the legacy of these people will be something that will be valued uh, by you for your life and uh, for those that you come in contact with and influence too. After prayer, I'd just like to make a couple of announcements. Father, I thank you that we've been able to have this journey with the reformers and the people that uh, joined them and so often it was the people who joined who became the martyrs who stood for what they believed in. Father, may we stand for what we believe in. May not have to face that kind of opposition yet, but can we be faithful to you in every situation and be a witness to you because we want Jesus to come soon and we want the, the sin of this world to be gone and the pleasures and sinlessness of the world ahead to be spent at the feet of Jesus and praise him always for the salvation he has pro he's provided for us is our prayer. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Several people have been asking questions, so I thought I'd just quickly make uh, these uh, questions clear as we uh, come out of here. Um, I shall place just at the, um, uh, on the floor down here just a, a blank sheet of paper. Some people have asked, uh, yes, we can have access to a visual of this again, because remember that if you go to the link um, for your North Australian uh, conference, you can find the, um, uh, on YouTube, you can find these five uh, talks and the, what's been on the projector. Uh, apparently it's been all recorded and it's all there for you to see again at your own leisure. So that's, there's that way of going through it again. But um, some of us, can, have you got any written stuff? Well, I do have a, uh, probably a, it's about a 20 page document just for covers what we've covered here. Um, it wasn't specifically prepared for us here because I was kind of thinking, oh, well, maybe the, uh, um, the YouTube would sort of do for folks these days. They wouldn't be worried about, you know, written bits and pieces. But if you're a person who wants a written piece and I can send it to you by internet, um, you're welcome to put your name and your email address on here and I will send to you, I'll, I'll just take the heading off it, which is for where I took it last pre-COVID, um, and put your address and details on it, but you'll see it might be organised chapter-wise a little differently than it is here, but it does cover the same information that we've covered, and uh, not all the detail, of course, but uh, a lot of it, that's there. So that's there for those of you who want a written account to come on email. Um, and we've also mentioned that if you uh, are wanting to uh, see it again, then go to YouTube, or you can go to the ABC, and you can buy all the talks on a, a USB, I think it is, um, that you're able to also use to let, download to look at all these and the other presentations that are made at camp. So I wish you well. I'd like to thank particularly Dwayne. Um, Dwayne, I've really appreciated, I know I'm not looking at that screen all the time, but uh, wow, it's just made such a difference to uh, the, the brightness and the colour of the slides. It's really brought them out. So Wayne, thank you for providing that kind of facility for camp because it's really lifted these uh, slides like I've never had them uh, shown before. Sometimes I think people are peering trying to work out some of the detail on it. So uh, thank you for that. And uh, also thank you as a conference for the opportunity to come and visit you and to share this with you. May it be useful for you in your journey with Jesus Christ.